Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. Their financial support helps cover the costs associated with hosting and producing the Backyard Ecology podcast and blog. If you would like to join them, you can find more information on the Backyard Ecology website or by searching for Backyard Ecology on the Patreon website. Today we are talking to Kyle Leibarger. Kyle is a forester and conservationist from Alabama. Over the last year, he's also gained a lot of attention on TikTok and other social media platforms with his Native Habitat project. Hi, Kyle. Welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Hey, Shannon. Good to be here. Longtime fan of the podcast. And my wife and I have been listening to you even before my TikTok days. She's not as interested in, in nature stuff as I am. And your podcast has been a great source for teaching her things that uh, she gets tired of hearing me talk about. So that's a great source. Love the podcast. Excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy to hear that. And yeah, I don't I'm not on TikTok, so I don't follow you there, but I absolutely love watching your videos and everything on Facebook and following your work there. You, you have such a passion for the grasslands and the habitat work, and yeah, it's just so much fun. You're doing such amazing work there. Well, I appreciate it. It's uh, been fun, and, and I kind of got out of my comfort zone with TikTok, but uh, it's always uh, exciting to share this kind of stuff with people, and that's, I guess, my main passion is is getting others as excited about this kind of stuff as I am. Yes, exactly. Which is why I kind of feel like, even though this is the first time we've talked in person, we've talked on social media, on Facebook a couple of times, but yeah, I kind of feel like you're almost a kindred spirit because you do. I mean, that's a lot of what I am too. I love sharing that passion, and enthusiasm, and helping others get excited about, which is why I know this is going to be a really fun conversation. Yeah. And that that's, really the reason I probably got started in native plants is because I was dealing with landowners and, and uh, getting to see their reactions after, you know, learning a plant that's on their property. That kind of fired me up and got me even more passionate about it. And so now I'm able to do it on an even larger scale. So that's pretty awesome. Yes, exactly. Well, let's start out by telling everybody just a little bit about how you got interested in the outdoors and nature and all that good stuff. Well, uh, I guess I've always been interested in it since I was since I was a little kid. But uh, then I was in Boy Scouts, and and then I was I went to forestry school. And while I was in forestry school, I was working for the state Fish and Wildlife. And then, you know, more specifically, getting into the native plants and grasslands and ecosystems, I was managing a property that I hunted, and I was cutting down a bunch of cedar trees and. After a year, all these wildflowers started coming up from underneath those cedar trees, and I didn't recognize any of them. And at, and at that time, I was already graduated from forest school, and so it kind of piqued my interest because I was like, I don't even know any of these plants. And, and I shared it with a botanist friend, and he was like, you know, I need to see this place. And it ended up being a limestone barren. And from that point on, I guess that kind of really piqued my interest in, in wildflowers and grassland ecosystems and, and managing and maintaining those. And I guess it all kind of started by accident and I accidentally started managing a limestone barren and improving it unknowingly. So that's, that's really probably what started it all, but I've always been interested in outdoors ever since I was really young. So. Yeah. I'm kind of like you have, it just always was, I was always interested in, in the outdoors growing up outside hiking and camping and playing in the old cow pasture next door. We had permission, my brother and I, to do that as long as we weren't messing anything up or tormenting the cattle. We could go out there and just wander and explore. And I spent many a day out there like that. And yeah. oh, I think I've got that same memory with uh, my grandparents with my cousins. So we we were always getting in trouble out there. And but it was it was fun. I think that's you know, that's probably the foundation of, you know, my interest in the outdoors. So it's, uh, it's interesting how early those, uh, you know, that passion can start. Yes, exactly. So tell us about your native habitat project. Well, this started, I guess, this past summer uh, after TikTok kind of blew up. 
people were, were asking me what I was doing and I didn't really know I didn't have a name or you know for it or anything I was just a guy who was going around and and uh saving small grass and remnants and so I started the native habitat project and really it was started after I discovered that limestone barren I started learning all those plants and I started recognizing you know what those grassland ecosystems looked like and then as I was doing my day job as a private forester uh, I was looking at tons of different private properties and driving just the randomest back roads and I would start seeing things and I ended up coming across a lot of really rare ecosystems and really unique grasslands and because of my friend who's a botanist who really he's a teacher and he's a science teacher and a botanist and he's not able to get out and really find a lot of these places and I am we kind of made a good team and, and he uh, taught me a whole lot about these places and I just keep stumbling across them and and a lot of my roadsides or on private property and I'll stop and tell a landowner about them or uh, on the roadsides, the places that are prone to getting sprayed or mowed uh, with the native habitat project. We now put up signs, um, no mow, no spray signs on roadsides to kind of save some of these rare plants and rare ecosystems. And, and not all of them are super intact. A lot of them are, but um, they're kind of a glimpse, you know, they're maybe an acre or two, you know, on average, just small little places on the sides of roads they're kind of a glimpse into what our grasslands here in, in Alabama would have looked like. And, and I think, you know, those places are super important to save because we've lost a lot of our really large examples of what our grasslands look like. And so we can use these places to uh, kind of guide us in restoring some other grasslands. And so that's uh, in a nutshell, that's kind of what the Native Habitat Project is. And I think you kind of touched on a very important point there because a lot of these small remnants that you're finding are along the roadsides or on private property. And you and I both know we now have less than 1% of our grasslands and prairies that used to be here. But it's easy. And I think most of us do this. We hear something is rare and we think, oh my gosh, it's got to be off in some very pristine remote location because it's rare. It can't be something I see every day. But in this case, it's not true. Oh, no. A lot of times these remnants, these places are places that are, like you said, right along the roadside in somebody's yard, places that the people who are there see it every single day. They just don't realize what they're seeing because rare and normal and everything we see every day is normal to us. Rare and normal don't go together in our brains, but I mean, anybody could possibly have something like this right outside their door. Oh, oh yeah. And I have a really good example of that. There is a, uh, I'm, I'm, you're, you know, Dwayne Estes with Southeastern Grand Initiative. Mm -hmm. There is a really rare goldenrod called Porter's Goldenrod that he discovered a population of just across the line in Tennessee. And I think this is around 2000, 2005, 2008, somewhere in between there. But a uh, botanist from Canada was coming through Alabama and found a population of it in 2003 or 2004. And that was the first time that this plant, Porter's Goldenrod, had been found in 160 years. The guy who collected it in, oh gosh, I think it was, it was like 1860 or 1840. He collected it, took it to his herbarium, and then in like 1904, somebody was going through his collection and figured out that this was a new species of goldenrod, so they named it after this botanist. Well, that population, once Dwayne and uh, I think it's Dr. Simple from Canada found out what that plant was, they came back to Alabama and the population was gone and they had built a highway over it. So Dwayne had reached out to me, he said, I'm going to send you the location of where it was originally found and I want you to keep an eye out for it. Well, I pulled it up and it's not even a mile from my house. <laughs> really ironic. And so I start looking around for it and I find another population of it. And so I rediscovered it in Alabama and it is in a residential neighborhood with really, you know, expensive homes. And there is one lot in between two houses that never had a house built on it. And, you know, it only gets mowed a couple times a year. 
and I found about 15 to 20 plants there that weren't getting mowed over. Uh, the rest of the population was getting mowed over and uh, we kind of put a stop to that, uh, thankfully. And now there's several hundred individual plants there, but it's in a neighborhood. I mean, it's the last place you would think you'd find a rare species, but you know, you said 1% of our grasslands are left. Well, here in Alabama, I think it's like 93% of our uh, land is privately owned. So a lot of these places, most of them are on private lands and people don't know if they don't know what they look like. They have no idea how to manage them. And that's something we can all help out with. That's something we can all educate people on. And so that's kind of why I like to speak up and, and stop and talk to landowners about it. Yes, exactly. And yeah, that is amazing. And you know your plants. Dwayne knows his plants. And to have it, like you said, right less than a mile from your house as being this plant that wasn't even yeah. known to exist anymore for so Two many places, years. Places in the world, it's it's S1 G1, which is the highest rarity ranking there is. So it's probably the rarest plant I'll ever find. And, and and hopefully we're hoping to find more populations of it, but it's super rare. Just, it's incredible. Just right outside your door and you never know. Yeah. And then this whole neighborhood has this place that they can go and see this any time they want to. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. Yes. And that's one of the reasons why the more I get into doing habitat consulting and talking to private landowners and stuff about the plants and the animals that they have, I really have started to believe that if you're not in a place that has either been used as a crop field for a gazillion and a half years, so tilled and disked and planted and everything like that, or you're not in like a subdivision where it's been houses and you've got traditional yard forever, that if you're wanting to create these pollinator gardens and these natural habitats and prairies that a lot of people are wanting to do now that you need to get somebody out there who knows their plants to actually look at what you've got before you start doing the kind of generic prescription that everybody gives of clear off the vegetation till it does get planted and seeds because you may have something already that's really amazing and I've run into that a couple of times myself where being on somebody else's land looking at, at it with them they're asking me, okay, we want to take what's been a hay field and turn it into a prairie. When's the best time to kill off the vegetation, disc it, plant it, where's the best place to stick the seeds, all those things that you hear everybody recommend. And I take a look at the plants. And I go, no, don't do that. Please don't do that. We need to run a fire through here. We need a, you, you've got the plants already. Let's see what else comes back. Yeah, that's that's the exact approach I'm taking on on my own property, and and you know, granted, it'd be easier to start over from a blank slate and just plant some native seeds. But to me, what's exciting about it is being able to, you know, what I did was remove the fescue, um, and so that's easy to treat because it's green when a lot of our natives are dormant. So you can treat it, get rid of it, run fire through there, and watching that seed bank come back and seeing what shows up on your property. It's, it's really fun. And, and I keep a list in my phone of everything I see on my property. Every time I find a new native plant uh, that shows up, I, I put it on a list and, and there's probably 7,500 species on there now that have returned since I've gotten rid of my monoculture of uh, fescue, but it's, it's, it's harder, you know, because you gotta, you gotta, treat these individual invasives differently. You know, I've got Bahia grass and Bermuda in some spots and, and I'll just spot treat those, but you don't have to go through and broadcast the entire place and just, you know, start over from nothing because there's a lot of times there's something good in the seed bank that's already there. So you're taking a lot of the fun out of it. If you do that, you get to see what returns on its own. Yes. And on our property, we're kind of taking a mixed approach because I know of looking at the old 1950s aerial photographs, our property was almost completely cleared back in the 40s and 50s, heavily row cropped and agriculture on a lot of it. So there's places that I know the seed bank's pretty much destroyed. There's not going to be a whole lot there. So those places were doing more intensive stuff. There's other places on our farm that it's like, okay, let's open up the woods a little bit because they're way too close to canopy right now. And there's nothing on the understory anymore. So we want to open that up, 
and then do a combination of seeing what's coming back and then adding in as needed. Because again, those woods, most of them on our property aren't 70 years old. And I know that that was heavily impacted before. So it's not like we've got a lot left, but in those places that we might have, yeah, we're looking to see what comes back naturally as well. Yeah. And that brings to mind, like these grasslands, a lot of them need disturbance. Um, you know, whether it's removing trees or fire, that limestone barren that I, you know, first got me interested in native plants. I was, I was up there two days ago and I was walking around looking at just a ton of cedar trees that had encroached and shaded out the understory. So there's none of those wildflowers are able to bloom because these cedars have just filled in the canopy. And I looked on the ground and there was a chunk of old stump and it was covered in black, uh, like charcoal. So this place had seen fire in the past. It wasn't since this landowner owned it. So it's been at least 30 years plus probably since the fire had been through there. And with the lack of that fire, those trees were able to come back. So a lot of these places need some form of disturbance like fire or, or removing some trees, less desirable trees and bringing in some sunlight to the ground. And that's a great way. If you have a forested property, that's a great way to increase your, you know, the biodiversity, the plant diversity you have on your, on your property is get some more sunlight onto the ground if, if you can. Yeah, that's what we're starting with first is getting rid of some of those cedars that have come in and just like everything, nothing but cedars. Yep. And I mean, they're nice, tall, 70 year old cedars in some cases, but yeah, we'd rather have the diversity because there's nothing in there. Yeah. And you, and you don't have to, you don't have to remove all of them. Just, you know, that's what I tell people is you don't have to remove all of them. You don't have to burn the entire place, you know, burn some in the fall, burn some in the spring, mix it up. The more diverse you are with managing your property, the more diverse responses you're going to get, the more plant diversity you're going to have. So I mix it up. And to me, that kind of takes away some of that, uh, you know, it can, it can be overwhelming. And that takes that a little bit of that away if you can just bite off little chunks at a time and just, you know, you don't have to manage your property, your entire property the same exact way. So Exactly. And we keep saying diverse management gives you diverse plants, but those diverse plants also gives you diverse wildlife and pollinators. And I mean, it's just amazing what comes back when you've got all this diversity and different types of habitat on your property. Yeah, absolutely. And people, people call me the the flower guy. And I oftentimes forget that like my main interest, even growing up was wildlife. Like that's why I started this in the first place. But if you just focus on wildlife, I mean, and and managing their numbers or something, you're never going to improve their habitat to manage wildlife. You have to focus on the plants, the plants that exist there. That is their habitat. Their entire habitat is based on what's growing there. And so that's why when I figured that out, I just kind of went all in on native plants and, and uh, managing those ecosystems. Because if you have good ecosystems, you're going to have lots of insects and you're going to have lots of wildlife and every native species of wildlife we have either eats native plants it eats insects that are attracted to those native plants or it eats something that eats one of those things and there's there's nothing else i mean that's it the foundation is native plants so when i realized that that's really when i got passionate about it and and on on a a rim that i found just down the road from here it was solid little blue stem and I thought that was interesting that's what caught my attention about this place plus there was one wildflower I think it was light poppy mallow that is really rare in Alabama so I ran a fire through this because it hadn't been burned and who knows how long and that fire has brought back tons and tons of wildflowers because I, I burned it in the fall and fall you know burning in the fall usually benefits more wildflowers and burning in the spring you know benefits warm season grasses so by doing that I was able to get more wildflowers which created more seeds and attracted more insects and this past spring the neighbor saw a covey of quail on that place and so it's interesting how just you know managing a grass and like that it's only four acres it's a small little portion but it's amazing how the quail showed up like that because I hadn't seen them around here since I was a kid that is amazing and I'd love to have that happen on our property. 
I grew up listening to them, spooking them out of the cattle pasture. I mean, walking through and you just all of a sudden the whole ground explodes and there goes a covey of quail. But I mean, my mother still lives in that house that I grew up in and we don't hear them like we used to from her property. And then my husband and I, our house is about 45 minutes or so away from mom. And it looks like something you would expect to see quail in this area, but I've never heard a quail here and neither has he, but yeah, it'd be so awesome to have the quail back. Yeah. And that's another thing, you know, it, that place originally looked really good for quail with all, with all the little blue stem and by doing this burn and bringing back diversity, that's, that's really what quail want. Even a species that you think of as a, you know, grassland species, you would think that they mainly need grasses, those native horses and grasses, but they can't survive in just native horses and grasses. They need uh, a mix of different species and wildflowers to attract insects and create seeds. And, and so that's the main thing you, you uh, create more plant diversity, you're going to create more wildlife diversity on your property. And I think that's all of our goals, probably mm-hmm. in, the, in, the, in the long run, even if it doesn't seem like it, you know, we're all focused on native plants, but that's really the goal is to help out all the, the wildlife. Yeah, like you, I mean, I'm, I'm a wildlife person. I've got my degree in wildlife biology. And I mean, the plants were just kind of sort of there until I realized the importance of the plants to the wildlife. And then it was from the wildlife that I got interested in the plants and then kind of playing back and forth. And same thing as I got into the pollinators with them as well. It was the pollinators that led to the plants, but then now it's like so much focus is on the plants because that's the basis. You have to have your foundation in before you can get everything else. Yeah, yeah. And a neat story here on my property from my, uh, you know, some of my experiences is is this is something I would have never thought about back in the day, but I have a pond behind my house and no bass in it at all. I could never have bass. It was mostly catfish and we had to feed them food and we couldn't get bass to survive in there. And that's because we mowed around the entire edge. And now I've allowed all the banks all the way around, except for a few spots where I mow down so we can fish. I've allowed wildflowers to come up and nobody thinks about managing, you know, a fish, a bass with all flowers. Like who would think about that? But, you know, by planting these wildflowers on the banks, uh, we've attracted insects and now I've got tons and tons of bass in there and it's the healthiest my pond's ever been because it's a functioning ecosystem again there. There's wildflowers that are attracting insects that are feeding bass. And I mean, it's just a cycle and, and we've disrupted that cycle in a lot of our properties. Yeah. I like that because yeah, I hadn't brought that whole context in my mind down to the ponds and the aquatic systems, even, I mean, yeah, out in, out in the wilds, I think of that, how important the surrounding habitat is for the lakes and the rivers and the creeks. But thinking about it, it, I hadn't made that connection with the ponds and stuff that are on our properties yeah it's 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 just unique native plants are just the amount of stuff you can manage just by managing native plants and your diversity is it's incredible and i guess that's what really got me all in focused on it because i mean before that i was you know like most hunters i was focusing on a lot of gimmicks and stuff like that and once i saw the results for myself with actually managing ecosystems I was all in and I guess that's kind of, I guess the passion and stuff has gone from there, but yeah, it's, it's cool what you can, uh, you can manage with just native plants. Yes, exactly. So we've said that a lot of these native prairie grassland ecosystems are on these private lands, but a lot of us don't, we don't know what we're looking at and it's normal. So we don't think of it. So what should we be looking at? What are some of those things that you look for that says, Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I need to give this place a second look. So prior to my TikTok days, now I have people, you know, messaging me and sending me pictures of places they got. And then that kind of helps me find places. But but prior to that, I was trying to learn my wildflowers and native plants. And so I was constantly, you know, I'm ADD and I'm an easily distracted driver, unfortunately. (laughs) Um, My wife hates it, but um, I, I was constantly looking for things that were blooming on the side of the road and mainly to start learning my native plants and on several occasions I would see a flowering plant I'd stop on the side of the road and try to identify it couldn't identify it 
and I would just rack my brain trying to figure out what it was. And I'd end up sending it to my botanist friend. He'd, he'd say, Oh, this is, this is this plant. That's really, that's really unique. Or, you know, I'd put it in iNaturalist, which is a great tool. And, you know, you click on the species information and you can look at a map and see where, where it's found. And when I find something here in Alabama that nobody else has documented in Alabama, or it's, you know, mainly found out in the Midwestern states, um, that tells me it's probably a prairie species. And that's how I was coming across it early on. Now, just from reading books and stuff, I know a lot of native wildflowers that I hadn't even seen in person. So just picking them up out of the corner of my eye, driving down the road, that's how I found a lot of stuff. And and a lot of indicator species, you know, your native warm season grasses, you know, little blue stem, big blue stem. Some of those are easier to spot around here for like barren areas, for barrens, limestone barrens, sandstone barrens and glades. Looking for rocky places. That's that's something that catches my attention all the time. So if I see a real rocky area that has, you know, some openings and a lot of grasses. That's a great place to find some rare plants. You know, then there's and then there's trees that kind of indicate too. You got a lot of savanna species. The Porter's goldenrod was found in a savanna where you have a bunch of uh, post oaks and and uh, other oaks and hickories and and so you kind of pick up on what to look for, I guess, as you find places. And everywhere is different. Like you know, the things I'm picking up on around here is going to be different. You know, a few counties over, I mean, you're going to be, you're going to have different types of grasslands and ecosystems and different plants are going to make up the majority of those grasslands or ecosystems. And uh, that's, that's where it comes down to kind of getting out in the field and learning. And, and to me, that's the exciting part. That's the part I love the most is getting out there and learning about them. And uh, another great way is to make connections around you and figure out, you know, find other people who have found some of these places and it will take you to see some of them and, and then you'll start recognizing them. And so when you're, you know, on your property or on, you know, driving down the road, you'll, you'll spot some stuff. You'll spot some of those plants you saw, you know, while out walking, uh, grassing with a botanist or something. I mean, it's the more you get out there, the easier it is to find them, I feel like. So that's the best way to do it. And that's kind of how I, how I uh, stumbled into finding them. So. Yeah. But you mean everybody doesn't, look along the side of the road as they're driving and identify plants or birds that that's not normal I thought everybody did that <laughs> I guess I guess it's just us okay. <laughs> but no my, I'll tell you one thing my wife doesn't do that so it's in her mind it's just me so <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure there's a lot of us out there just uh, a lot of us like like-minded folks but to me that's the that's the joy of nature is, is exploration and and finding you know discovery and, and learning mm -hmm. to me that's the that's part of the curiosity of nature and, and and it's just human I think it's just a human instinct to enjoy looking for things and and uh, being outdoors and learning I mean to me that's the fun part a lot of times I wish I could I mean there's always something to learn and I'll never I'll never learn everything about native plants and these ecosystems and you know somebody who's ADHD like me like I usually get into something and I get out of it real quick once I learn it all and master it. Well, I'll never do that with, you know, this, you'll never learn everything. But even then, a lot of times I wish I could start over because that was the fun part was getting out learning um, just your basic plants. That's, mm -hmm. that's the fun part to me. So that's what I recommend if you're interested in, in finding some of these places around you and learning about the ecosystems and what the areas around you used to look like, just get out there and start learning plants anything that's flowering that's the easiest way every week i'd go out and i'd look for something that was flowering and i'd go and take pictures of it and i'd come home and try to try to figure out what it was and, and to me you can't there's there's nothing better than that it's, it's fun and it's, it's exciting and, and you're learning something so and you had mentioned the trees and knowing the trees which whether it's the flowers or the trees or the grasses if you know those indicator species or those storytelling species, then that's always helpful. But one thing I've found too with the trees, it helps to know the trees and you do need to know the trees eventually, but just for the first glance, especially during the winter, this is really easy during the winter, just look at the trees themselves and how they're growing. And especially your larger trees that you can tell have probably been there for a good deal. If you've got a lot of branches fairly close to the bottom, you see a lot of those branches kind of coming up and stuff, 
that's an indication that as a seedling, it was in a more open area. So it started putting out those branches sooner. If it's straight, tall trunk and all the branches are up at the top, that's usually an indication that it probably grew where there was a lot of competition for light. And so it had to go up fast, tall before it started putting out the branches. So you can start to even get an idea just from the growth forms of the trees. Oh, yeah. And that you just described a lot of the savannah remnants that I've, I've found. And, and it's a lot of times post oaks, blackjacks, chinkapins. A lot of those oaks just are just real limmy. But then in between them, you get a lot of a lot of cedar or loblolly or just some of your fast growing trees that are just, you know, smaller. And you can tell they're not as old and they're in between all of these. And to me, that's the easiest, the easiest places to restore because all you need to do is go in there and remove those undesirable species in between those. And then after a year or two, the sun getting to the ground, you've got a fully restored savanna just about. And so I found a uh, purple milkweed in Alabama this year. And it was because of TikTok guy saw me and wanted me to come do a wildlife consultation on his property and we found this milkweed on there and uh, I was waiting for it to go and bloom and it finally went and bloom and he sent me a picture of it it was purple milkweed which has never been found in Alabama like as a it was a state record the closest population was like hundreds of miles away and it was in what you just described post oaks and black jacks just big large trees with stretching out limbs I mean just crazy looking trees and in between was a bunch of young young loblolly and so what we're gonna do on that property i guess is go through there and remove some of those loblollies and then when it's all said and none it's a it's a savannah and there's rattlesnake master and and illinois bundle flower i think there's antelope milkweed there's four four or five species of milkweeds on this property i mean it's going to be incredible seeing all this return and get back to the state that it used to be in but yeah just picking up on some of those things uh and what the tree structures look like that can that can lead you to some cool discoveries that's amazing i've never seen purple milkweed in the wild i i mean i've seen it being grown cultivated but never in the wild that'd be cool yeah i hadn't either until that one that's the only one uh only there was well there was probably 20 to 30 plants there but that was the first time i'd ever seen it either and didn't even know it was anywhere close to Alabama. So that was, that was neat. Yes, it is. And then you mentioned looking at those rocky areas too, which is something that I think a lot of times gets overlooked because everybody thinks that you have to have really good, deep, rich soil. And I've, I've had people ask me, how's the best way to cover up those rocky areas so that they could get some good prairie plants going there. And I'm like, uh, let me see your rocky area first, (laughs) because I mean, sometimes it's, development has scraped away the topsoil now you're down to the rock and other times it's uh no 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 this is this is good this is what you want to have and it's a whole different group of plants that you have there yeah and there's oftentimes less invasives Mm -hmm. because they're not adapted to growing in those conditions and our native plants are and so those glades and barrens a lot of times this time of year are really wet there's a lot of water on the ground that are really saturated then summertime, they're dry as a bone, like a desert. And so the plants that can exist there are only going to be your glade barren species. Like you're not going to have a lot of invasives really. So there's some really cool things on those types of places. And those glades and barrens, what's growing there is depending on what kind of rock is there. So, I mean, that first place I found was a limestone barren and it was covered in cedars and it was just real rocky. And I had, being a deer hunter, the first part of it, I had went in there and sprayed off everything and planted a food plot, trying to make it better for wildlife. I was trying to make it better for wildlife and I killed everything off and tried to plant some food plot mixes in there. And looking back, uh, it, uh, I wish I could go back and change that. But I'm now, you know, the past four or five years, I've been restoring that area back into, you know, what the other three fourths of the property looks like. But I, I had destroyed a glade, but at the same time, on the other end, I was cutting down trees, trying to bring sunlight to the ground to create more natural brows. And I was improving a glade on that end. And, and now on that property, there's been four or five county records. There's probably 
five or six state listed species. I found the northernmost population of Durand Oak and uh, in Alabama on that property, which is really cool. And if I didn't know what I was doing, I could have cut that little oak tree down. But thankfully, I was managing it for wildlife and I was leaving the oaks and cutting down the cedars. But yeah, these rocky places are really, really unique. And there's a lot of really cool plants that you can find there. And they're also really great for wildlife. And to me, some of the neatest places to get out there and like recreate and enjoy and walk around and just observe um, what's there. Because a lot of them just seem like otherworldly. Like when you walk onto them, it's like you're on the moon or something with all the rocks and it's like a desert in Alabama. Like who would ever thought, but um, they're, they're really cool places. And, and I've got a million stories about different glades and barrens that I found at different types. And I could probably talk about that for, for hours. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't mind, but yeah, I mean, they are, I've run into several too. We've got them around and my general area. We don't have any on our property, but I've, run into them as well and seeing where people have tried to plant trees or some stuff over them and like one several years ago they had planted pine trees on it to try and get something anything growing there and I hadn't planned on going to this place and so I didn't have any of my books or stuff but at the last minute I was invited to go and I was like yeah that'd be fun to go see and we were actually going to look at something else and the owner took us up to this rocky area based on how excited my husband and I were getting about some of the other plants we're seeing in other areas. He's like, well, this is a little different area. Why you might want to see this. So he took us up to this rocky area, as he called it. And there was Lyatris blazing star growing there. There was at least three, if not four or five different species of goldenrods. Unless I've got my keys with me, I, I don't take goldenrod past Solidago or goldenrod. But I could just looking at them go, okay, by the growth form and where those flowers are at and how they're coming off the stem, we've got at least three species here. And I'm like super excited. And he's just kind of chuckling to himself because he thought it was nothing. It was just a really poor area. And I'm like, oh no, this is, this is amazing. Yeah. Those places, man, they, I love them. I have a, a quick story. My in-laws property, they have five acres and I saw there's several kind of indicator species on it. And their neighbor contacted me to look at a property that he has that was about 300 acres and it was down in like the river bottoms and we were looking at it. I got to talking to him about his property next to my in-laws and I was like, do you have any rocky places on it? And he was like, oh yeah, tons of like limestone rocky areas. And so we went and looked at it and it's, it was 900 acres and we get off the top of the hill and we're passing like these bare dirt areas. And he's like, oh, these are dirt pits. Uh, this happened just two or three weeks ago he's like all these are just dirt pits and I was like looking at them and just driving by I was like huh that's weird because it doesn't look like the kind of dirt people would want to use for you know building houses and neighborhoods and stuff but then we get to those limestone areas and it's the same thing blazing stars you know the liatrices rattlesnake master downy pagoda there was a ton of diversity on them and then we I get to look at these dirt pits and they look like deserts, just rolling deserts with this real chalky soil. And there's liatris out there, big blue stem, Indian grass, gray-headed coneflower, all sorts of, uh, there's, I think, four different liatrises on this place. You got the scaly, like the scaly blazing star, rough blazing star, the showy blazing star, which I had never seen before, the, the real showy one. That was neat. Man, this place was really, really, really neat. And across that 900 acres, there's maybe 20 to 40 acres that's open and allowing sunlight to get to the ground. And if all the cedars were removed, there would end up being like 150, 200 acres of these chalky prairie barrens, these prairie washes, and then limestone barrens. And that's going to be a neat place to do some work at, I think, in the future. And that's kind of the direction I'd like to head with the Native Habitat Project is, for one, I want to educate people on native plants and, and these ecosystems, but two, I want to save a lot of these prairie remnants because just this year I watched a really diverse prairie get destroyed and have two or three houses built on it. And I had just found it and hadn't really had time to get out there and inventory it, but there was all kinds of good stuff there. And so I want to, I'd love for the native habitat project to kind of head in that direction where we can, you know, do some work on private lands and save some of these barrens and put in the work because 
remove trees and you got a grass and that's it. I mean, that's the equation. And, and uh, man, it, it's going to be exciting to see how diverse that place is. Cause you know, like I said, I just saw it two or three weeks ago and it's winter time now. So there's going to be all kinds of cool stuff there come summer, I'm sure. So. Yes. That'll be one that'll be really fun to watch come alive. Yeah. yeah I mean, 150, 200 acres of prairie remnants. Um, oh, so far, the biggest ones I've found is maybe, you know, four or five acres on roadsides and, and little corner lots. And so this one could be a huge grassland. And for those chalky barrens, this property makes up 75% of the entire existence of that ecosystem. I mean, there's several more of those chalky barrens in Colbert County, just a few counties over, but uh, they're nowhere near that large. So this is a really important place and it's on private land. The landowner had no idea. So that's what I like to do. I like to you know, educate landowners on what they have. And I think it's really important. And if, if we don't get out there and do this and, you know, this is something your listeners can start doing in their area. Just get out and educate people on what they got and show them, you know, a prairie room that you found in your area. And they may say, Oh, I've seen a place like that, or just get out there and start educating people. That's something we can all do to help out these, these ecosystems. Yeah. It starts with learning ourselves what's out there and educating ourselves and then sharing that with everybody else. And then, like you said, once people are aware, then we can move to, we have to be able to move to action and on the ground. Let's, let's start saving these and doing what we can to help the system before we do lose them. Yeah. And that's, that's what I'm all about is getting out there and and making something happen. That's why I like to do things on the private side. I don't have to go through a bunch of red tape. I just go out there and throw up a sign on the side of the road and I don't have to get permission or anything. I mean, it's easy to just get started and educate. I mean, it's, we can all do it. You know, every day I try to go do something like that, go cut a Bradford pear or cedar down out of a prairie. I mean, it takes five or 10 minutes to get out there and remove one. I mean, it's something we can all do and and it doesn't take that much time and and we can start improving some of these places and making sure they're staying around for future generations and for our wildlife. People think that I, you know, went to school for grasslands and I didn't learn any of this in school. I learned about trees and that was it. So anybody can do it. Just get out there and and try and and be willing to learn and uh, be willing to share what you find out and and don't be afraid to uh, stop and knock on somebody's door and say, Hey, can I look at this wildflower here? And they may say, yeah, I'll come with you. And you can show them and you'd be surprised how many times people are, they'll be proud of that. You know, if you tell them it's there, you come back and see them in a couple of weeks and be like, man, I showed my kids, my grandkids, took them out there and showed it to them. They, they loved it or, or show somebody I'm naturalist. I was on a property where this guy grew up there. He was probably in his eighties and could barely use a cell phone, but he had grew up there and I was going around taking pictures and I was showing him what plant looked like when it was in flower. And he was like, man, that is neat. And so I downloaded the app for him. And I looked back a couple of weeks later and on his property, there were just hundreds <laughs> of plants that he had gone around taking pictures of, but he was like, I've lived here my entire life. I grew up here and I had no idea what these plants were. I had no idea this existed on my property. And just your average person has more interest in this kind of stuff than you would imagine. So. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, we all feel a sense of connection, I think, to our land and to our property, especially if you're somebody who loves nature and being outside. The the type of people that would be listening to this podcast or following you on TikTok or on Facebook with the Native Habitat Project. I mean, we all love it. We may not know everything about it. I mean, I'm the first to admit there's a lot I don't know. Like you, I will always be learning. And as I get to know one group of animals or plants pretty well, then usually by that time I've seen something else that grows with them, visits them, eats them. And I'm like, Ooh, and like you said, ADHD and off I'm on another tangent and you can never learn it all. And that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. One of my biggest questions I get on TikTok is what should I plant in my yard? Like I'm in Idaho. What do I need to plant? I'm like, Look, I don't know. Like you're asking the wrong person. Uh, I know about native wildflowers, but I know about my area. You know, but the best thing you could do is go find somebody in your area that's also interested in native plants, and that's going to be your best source or your closest native nursery. That's the best way to do it, in my opinion. And and uh, I started a Facebook group this past year. Uh, I guess it was February of 2021, so it hasn't even been a year. But it's called Native Habitat Managers, and it is full of, you know, are you, I think you're, are you on there? 
I think I am. Yes. But it's a, so it's a, a group we started because there's a lot of habitat groups, but most of them are focused towards hunters, but there's a lot of hunters in those groups who are interested in native plants. But then there's a lot of native plant enthusiasts who aren't interested in hunting. And they, the native plant enthusiasts, a lot of times know way more about native plants than these hunters do, but these hunters are wanting to manage their properties like an ecosystem. And so we started this group, Native Habitat Managers, to kind of mesh the two, which seems crazy, you know, hunters and, you know, native plant enthusiasts, gardeners, you'd think those groups don't really mesh, but it was, it's been really surprising how well these groups have meshed and everybody's come together and shares information, uh, shows off projects, and it's a great place to meet others in your area. I've witnessed myself more than, you know, dozens of times where somebody says, well, you know, I live in this area and then so-and-so says, well, you need to go to this nursery. This is where you need to go get plants. Well, that's just five minutes down the road. Like it's a great place to like connect and, and find others who are interested. And I encourage everybody to, to follow that group. It's a, if you're interested in native plants and you're able to cooperate with others and for the better good of ecosystems, it's a great group to be a part of. So if you're looking for others in your area, get on there and, and introduce yourself. And I promise there's probably a lot of people from your state and your area on there. So Yes. And I love that bringing together all the different groups because there are so many different groups of people out there that are really interested in the same basic thing. We're just approaching it at different angles and we're so much stronger together and being able to come together and help each other out. And I, I mean, I love that concept. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm really passionate about getting hunters interested in native plants because they have a huge stake in native ecosystems and it's not talked about nearly enough. A lot of them are out there removing invasives already. They're removing invasives, but they don't know much about you know native plants, these ecosystems. And if we can all work together and you know get on the same page, we can really make some changes on private properties and the hunters, they're already out there. They spend a ton of money every year on private lands, managing wildlife. They spend tons of time out there managing ecosystems for wildlife. If we can nudge them in the right direction, you know, same nudge that I got when I discovered that limestone barren, we can, you know, do a world of good across, you know, the U.S. I mean, there's hunters in every state and they're all about creating more wildlife. So if we can show them more native plants, better ecosystems means more wildlife you don't have to say much more and they're they'll get on the same page and so that's something I'm pretty passionate about as well so yes exactly well this has been so much fun and really educational I know you and I could talk for hours and hours and hours about this stuff but is there anything else that you would like to share with us um if you'd like to uh check out the native habitat project on Facebook and Instagram that would be awesome also, I'm on TikTok. It's Native Plant Talk on TikTok, but the Native Habitat Project, we also have Patreon, and that's the best way to support um, the Native Habitat Project and, and uh, help us help us grow and save some grass and remnants. But that's it. I just appreciate you having me on. Oh, it's it's been great. And yes, I will definitely have links in the show notes to your TikTok, your Facebook pages, your Patreons site. And I do encourage also everybody to go and check out all of Kyle's work because he is doing such amazing work. But oh, you've got a small scale native plant nursery too, don't you? I do. Yeah. I have a lot of irons in the fire. Yeah. My wife and I uh, started a native plant nursery two years ago. This will be our third growing season. And uh, it's just all local plants that I've collected seeds from and, and uh, growing those plugs for, for restorations was my original purpose. But you know, most of our customers are just homeowners and gardeners uh, looking for you know native wildflowers so uh yeah i'm no professional amateur but last year i think we grew four or five thousand plugs and about 60 to 75 different species so try to try to keep it at a scale where it's not too overwhelming it's a it's a lot of work so yes it is i i'm like you my husband and i have a lot of irons in the fire one of them is a small scale native plant nursery so i completely get it but Yes. So if you're in Alabama area yeah. and are looking for native plants, check out Kyle as well. Tennessee Valley Natives is the, I'm in the Tennessee Valley of Alabama. So that's, it's confusing for people. I'm by the Tennessee rivers, but Tennessee Valley Natives, 
but we're in the state of Alabama. So. Yes. And I will put link to that as well in the show notes so people can find you for that as well. I appreciate it. Oh, no problem. Yes. This has been really, really fun. And thanks a lot. Have a great day. Yep. Thanks for having me on. Right, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. I really appreciate Kyle taking the time to talk with us today. I'm a fan of all the work that Kyle is doing and really had fun chatting with him today. I hope that you enjoyed our conversation too. If you did enjoy our conversation, then I encourage you to take a few minutes to look at Kyle's social media channels. He does a really good job of posting his content on multiple different platforms. So if you're like me and aren't on TikTok, then you can still follow him on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. I'm really hoping that this summer he posts videos of those chalky barrens that he mentioned, because that's a new type of grassland ecosystem for me, and I'm really looking forward to learning more about it. It also shows just how important it is for us to learn more about what's on our own properties or in our neighborhoods and communities. I mean, can you imagine finding out that you have something so rare and so special on your property or in your neighborhood? much less that what you have represents the vast majority of everything that's known for that species or plant community in the entire world. And you get to see it and enjoy it every single day. But like Kyle and I talked about, many of our remnant grasslands and rare native grassland plants are on private land or growing by the side of the road. In cases like these, one person or one neighborhood for the Porter's Goldenrod example, really can make a big difference. But it all starts with awareness and knowledge. And that's why I do what I do. And why I am so thankful to others like Kyle, who are doing what they do and are willing to share what they know. Because I know that I don't know everything, which is why I'm constantly striving to learn more. I think that's a sentiment that many of us share is that constant striving and curiosity and wanting to know and learn as much as we can about nature and everything that's around us. Before I wrap this up, I want to ask you to please tell someone else about this podcast. Word of mouth is really the fastest way for a podcast to grow. So your help in letting others know about the Backyard Ecology podcast is greatly appreciated. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.